um, which which means he's from Europe, um, and um, that uh, despite the preconceptions that we might have about Europe as a place where urbanism is much more stable and has a longer tradition, the the significance of Ole's work as an editor and as a writer is that like many of us in Los Angeles that um, he's recognized that architecture is in many ways a moving target and that um, that architecture and urbanism isn't something that's stable but is something that is constantly changing both in in physical form but also as a concept that um, the city oftentimes is used as a primary metaphor for culture but on the other hand that it's it, it can easily turn into an overused point of reference um, in all these words um, this is a mercurial time. Um, the discipline of architecture is moving incredibly quickly as a cultural medium um, and also as a dimension of cultural practice. Um, and um, he asks the question, what is happening to our space? That is the space of architecture as a, uh, as a discursive field. Um, and more specifically to publishing, he asks, or he says, traditional publishers want clear market niches and a straightforward editorial formula. Um, and if you know uh, Arcus, you'll know that it is something where um, it's interested in new cultural practices and in particular reaching a volatile readership. Um, and this, the, the idea that architecture is a moving target is something that also extends into practices. Um, as he says, um, uh, projects conform uh, no longer conform to one client and one architect. Um, now they are alliances of parties, engineers, installation engineers, and others, as well as architects who can all claim authorship. Um, and it's in that way that, that the, the magazine is something, too, where it's um, worked on alliances and collaborations with other people, as well as um, um, in doing so, um, been a measure of being able to read um, architecture at times when it's highly charged but not um, readily readable. Um, Ole, uh, since, 19, uh, since 2001, has been the editor-in-chief of Arcus. And um, the kind of changeability that, that you see in the magazine can be witnessed from issue to issue and from page to page in its design. Um, uh, and, and most significantly in the appropriation of other magazines like um, Dutch Magazine of Fashion, um, and contemporary culture magazine. Um, Ola is a, a studied and received a degree in cultural history at the University of Amsterdam um, and considers himself a cultural engineer. Um, his interest um, um, is to use architecture as a vehicle to understand culture. Um, he's been the curator of Manifesto Three in Slovenia, um, Ego Texture, History of Space, Freeze um, and Real Space Quick Time at NAI. Um, without further ado, please welcome Ola Bauman. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your kind words. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Sayak, for hosting me here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here, to be in Los Angeles, and to talk about thinking architecture, especially as I learned that this school is claiming its fame for um, being so proud of the process of making architecture. What I would like to uh, put forward is um, a strategy to think through and to think with architecture, uh, not just as making things, but perceiving our world uh, at large. And this might be um, especially interesting since um, uh, we need debate in architecture very much. We need debate between um, makers and thinkers, between the creative profession of architecture and the facilitary profession of architecture and between many other oppositions that are uh, more alive than ever today. 
But today is for one other reason, a very par particular day. Because, as you all know, um, today the war has been declared, more or less. Uh, I'm coming from Europe, as Jeffrey said already. And although it, I, I'm not coming from France, um, which is uh, at the moment uh, something like the scapegoat in international politics and debate about the future of our defense systems, um, I might be seen as more or less representing the old continent, the old Europe. Um, and I think, although I would like to present my work and to present ARCIS as a strategy, not as a product, but as a strategy to think. I think it's important to reflect upon this very issue of um, growing schism, growing divide between the new world and the old world in perceiving our uh, most important values. I would like to begin with um, a picture a moving picture. Let me go here. of moving pictures to show you tonight and we might have some difficulties with um, moving from one to the other sample but I hope it will work I won't speak just watch I hope you could read it. Gratitude, pass it on. What is this? What you've seen is a sample from uh, the Foundation for a Better Life. They are doing um, a campaign to teach the people um, basic social values like gratitude, strength, uh, curiosity, and things like that. Um, what you've seen with the sound of Born to be Wild uh, in the background, uh, I'm sorry you couldn't hear it, is um, a Hells Angel um, getting a flat tire, uh, wanting to phone home or something and uh, not having a coin available. And then two older black women are coming up and one of them gives her uh, Carter to the guy and in all this aggression, he suddenly um, shifts his mind and changes his mind and uh, th uh, thanks her for being so helpful. He says, uh, thank you, I really appreciate that. And this, this promotion of the idea that two generations and two races and two worldviews are coming together in that single moment of needing a, needing a carter um, um, that, that, that this moment could be seen as uh, essential to um, the much needed social coherence uh, uh, apparently as the view from this foundation. 
I think that's very important, a very important step in the transformation of values into something like a product. You can need the strategies of advertising to sell a value as a product. And if you know that the owner of this foundation, I mean the, the main funder, is a close friend of your president and one of the main sponsors of his uh, uh, election campaign and uh, a member of uh, another important foundation which is providing this government with uh, some of its main uh, intellectual uh, legitimacy, le legitimacy uh, strategies, uh, one can see that um, behind selling values there are also lots of interests at stake. Uh, one might say that never have so many been manipulated so much by so few. Um, and I think that's important to think about our cultural production today. And not just today, because this has reminiscences from some decades ago. Yesterday I read a book uh, from 1958, and it's titled Brave New World Revisited by Aldous Huxley. And talking about convincing people, he makes a difference between two types of speech, argument and propaganda. Argument is for intellectuals with a critical habit. It is meant to be convincing. He says, intellectuals are the kind of people who demand evidence and are shocked by logical inconsistencies and fallacies. One could say, like the, the French people today, who want this evidence from the United States, and it has been given today, actually, during the Security Council session. But to continue with Huxley, he talks about propaganda, and propaganda, according to Huxley, is not about convincing, but about overwhelming. It is about seduction. It doesn't address the intellect, but passions. Huxley says, propaganda teaches us to accept as self-evident matters, matters about which it would be reasonable to suspend our judgment or to feel doubt. These are ver two very important categories. Argument and propaganda. Two ways to convince people. Two ways of rhetoric. And I think another important distinction can be made related to different kinds of engagement with the stuff you're chewing on. Arguments, namely, need concentration. And propaganda is about distraction. Propaganda needs the spectacle. And my basic premise tonight is that we are now living much more in an age of passion than in an age of argument. It's about mass rhetoric, playing sentiments. Like this morning, no, it was yesterday, I, I watched uh, television on my hotel room and it was a full hour of uh, discussing the um, personality of Saddam Hussein. And there were a few guys who said that Saddam Hussein actually is not a person, it's not a human being, it's the name of a virus. Uh, Saddam Hussein is a virus because evil has the tendency to um, uh, work as a kind of parasite. It appropriates environments, it infiltrates, and it can be anywhere. Saddam Hussein is not just the head of state of Iraq, it is a virus that can be seen anywhere in this world. And was the conclusion of these people. Um, anywhere in this world, American troops are necessary to fight this virus. Well, if this kind of transformation of the way we see the world, we envision the world, is going on, maybe it's a big step, but I would like, for, the, for argument's sake tonight, ask the question, 
how can architecture respond to that? Fundamentally, modern architecture was for intellectuals. Some, someone like Le Corbusier, a true intellectual, making a whole oeuvre out of argument. Of course he was seductive, but he wanted always to convince people through argument. A life devoted to a cause, based on concentration. He said, as you might know, architecture is the, um, in, in French, architecture est le jeu savant correct et magnifique des volumes mis sous la lumière. Architecture is the scientific, correct, and magnificent game of volumes under the light. It's about science, it's about logic, it's about beauty. And for all these three, one needs the faculty of judgment. And even in the more frivolous modernism here in California, I can tell you, in, the, in most people, people's not so humble opinion, this modernism is still extremely boring. Not that seductive enough. enough. Um, too straightforward. It doesn't fit the experience economy. Modernism, whether it is in Europe or in the United States, is not for sentiments. But also postmodernism isn't. It's still about buildings. It's still about form. It's still a matter of stillness, standing still with your object. All these modalities of architecture are too slow for today's propaganda. What architecture used to be, enclosure, occupation, shelter, what is the, what is the role of these values in the age of propaganda? What can be seen as the role of cons construction? Is, isn't construction way too slow for our experience economy? You need, it needs, you need years to prepare and then months or maybe even again years to finish a building. And then the lifespan of a building, does it catch up with the um, ongoing uh, shifts of the experience economy? And I believe that this is one of the fundamental reasons of the contemporary marginality of the architectural profession. Because it's still about going the last mile, you know? It's this famous phrase from ICT industry, going the last mile. It was about reaching out to people to, uh, to uh, deal with um, a certain scale, to uh, address people and, 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 and mediate um, cultural messages to them. Uh, architecture is on the scale of, in the old sense, is on the scale of the last mile. You find the people, but you not really penetrate the people with architecture. Today, whether in, whether in ICT or in uh, uh, cultural uh, practice, people are not satisfied in, anymore with reaching the people. They want to penetrate you, going the last inch. And again, I ask the question, how can architecture regain a potential of a dimension to think in if this marginality is a truly existing phenomenon? Can it regain this potential to explore our culture, to express curiosity, to be creative if it's suffering from this marginalizing tendencies. And I believe it can, of course. And it does by seeing architecture as a way of publishing. And then I come to the title of my lecture. Architecture as a way of publishing. And as always, with publishing, you have good press and tabloid. I'll come back to that. But let me first 
tell you about the way the publishing of architecture, architectural criticism, architectural journalism changed under the new regime of propaganda. You know, whether it is Casabella or uh, uh, Domus or Arcis, most architectural press dealt with architecture in terms of the production of um, built environment, of objects, of constructions, buildings. And most of them still do, because that's the market that can be defined. And since most magazines are based on a market view and are barely, uh, badly needing a definition of their public, they still do the same thing as in the old days. But suppose that it is true that architecture in itself is either a dinosaur on the brink of dying out or a completely new practice close to publishing, um, we need other ways to define architecture itself as well. Like an architecture for a completely different client, an anonymous client of conglomerates, of uh, uh, an anonymous uh, conglomerates. Architecture redefining its um, um, interpretation of the uh, notion of the public vis -a -vis versus the private. What is public today? There is much of publicness inside. There is much of privatization outside. Architecture that is coming closer to the practice of consultancy. Architecture that is financed completely differently. Uh, architecture that is not about um, objects, but about events. Not about um, enclosures, but about processes. Architecture which is about creating situations rather than uh, providing shelter. Architecture in the age of the implosion of time and space, etc., etc. So many new questions are asked to architecture that architectural journalism cannot, can no longer just cover architectural production. It has to discover, discover new pockets of creativity, discover new opportunities for spatial thought. Um, let me show you a couple of pages from Arcus that might give you an impression how we do that. see here. Firstly, you can do that by choosing new subjects for architectural criticism. I mean, rather than focusing on the cultural dimension of architecture, what we try to do is to focus on the architectural dimension of culture. It's the reverse of the angle. Rather than understanding the output of a profession, one should ask the question, what does this profession do in mediating uh, strong social forces? For instance, what we recently did is presenting uh, a center for asylum seekers in Holland. It is not a very sophisticated um, function. The design of this building, although it has been done in Holland and even for asylum seekers there is a kind of culture ambition to, to, for architecture to uh, come to kind of stylization. Um, we try to detect how this architecture is dealing with the issue of refugees. 
but also in the same issue, thinking about the background of most refugees in Holland, Africa, we try to connect Prada with Africa. We try to figure out how um, uh, wars on uh, race wars or class wars are being fought in architecture. So that's a very important issue, ju not just presenting and documenting an existing project. We try to find connections between uh, uh, mostly hidden social tendencies. We also proposed a game. We presented the game. You could use the Arcus itself by tearing out some pages and making your own and, and giving yourself your own role in a mastermind game. Um, and you could call yourself, for instance, uh, Mrs. Prada, but also Mr. Intruder, uh, Professor Dr. Nothing, uh, Mr. Time, and play a game that has been described here. Um, and not just by writing about what's happening in this world, we try to raise awareness through proposing a certain game and let you play and find out yourself. This is for later. Another connection we try to make is between um, pop culture, um, Americanism, and the edge cities of the, of the European continent. Or to present you with uh, a design for a tie. It says, uh, Mr. Mayor, stop with the uh, grand projects in the city of Marseille. It was an article about Marseille. Or to uh, make yourself public by uh, supporting this mayor. So using the magazine as a tool to play a public role. But Marseille is also known as one of, as, as, a, as another very important edge city of, of Europe, where many times they find uh, drone asylum seekers on their cliffs. Or we try to raise the issue of um, urban warfare uh, by showing how a typically Dutch suburban pavement style, which is which is part of the suburban um, style that you might know from uh, many famous Dutch architects, um, is used as uh, a device to uh, exercise a new way to wage war, where no longer armies are confronted on the battlefield, but are uh, fighting from dwelling to dwelling, and from uh, drainage system to um, to um, gardens, private gardens, etc., etc., step by step, um, chasing terrorists or chasing uh, snipers and all the like. And this is, of course, not a very common subject for architectural press, but I think it's essential to find out how architecture is uh, staged as a background for new social realities. But apart from, I, I leave it with this, apart from proposing new subjects to approach architecture as a profession and as a cultural medium, we also like to propose new strategies to communicate with our readers.
as I said, criticism today can no longer be just about coverage, the coverage of reality. It has to invent reality. It has to discover opportunities and chances for architecture. And I will show you a couple of examples how we do that. Using a magazine as a tool, as a, uh, like, like a do magazine for adults, one might say. One, one could use this magazine as a vehicle, not just to consume some messages about our culture, but also to produce culture. So what I have here is a magazine which you can read. You can also tear out pages. suggest you to reshuffle Holland. These strips, 100 strips altogether, are representing different aspects of Dutch society. So for instance you have um, typical Dutch architectural images, but also typically Dutch faces, typically Dutch menus, typically Dutch uh, uh, road signs and all the like. And what we propose is a game to reshuffle Holland and make it your own country. To appropriate uh, Holland and trying to um, transgress this ongoing tendency to brand the Dutch. But there is more if you work with a magazine uh, uh, this way. There is more uh, possible, of course. For instance, here we have a fax page to Ulrich Beck. We have an article by Ulrich Beck about the risk society. And you can tear out a page and fax your comments to Ulrich Beck with his number. Um, a few other examples. Here is a page that can be used as um, a letter to your neighbor saying, let's not greet one another in future. And as such, establishing or de-establishing social relations. And here we have a page that can be used as a manifesto. It was printed twice. So the same page, one for yourself and one to give someone else. Or here we have even pages that were um, destroyed even before selling the magazine. What you see is the, rem is the, 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 the remnant of uh, a page torn out, making um, the reader curious about what should have been there, saying in the remaining control strip, the belly of the architect, piercings and tattoos, and it's suggesting that what had been there was the mermaid tattoo of Eric van Egerath. Or here we have a black fax to the Museum of Modern Art. It was an article. You might know what happens if you receive a black fax. It's not so nice for your fax machine. Uh, it says, I agree with John Packer in Arcus number no. two. Um, Works fierce. He wrote an article about Berkspheres, the MoMA exhibition. Berkspheres was very successful, but not very interesting. I just wanted to tell you this. <laughs> I can assure you, on the other side was a, was a white fax, and it was saying, I completely disagree with John Thacker. Or using an arc space as a mini poster, not just featuring uh, Todd Williams and Billy Tsin, uh, being a participant in the Guadalajara GVC Center competition, but also the client, Jorge Vergara, who was uh, equally prominent in the press pack we received. 
or using Marcus pages for um, going to the print shop and have your t-shirt printed with an interesting text that might be that might account for many Dutch famous emerging architects and wearing it this way well and in this space this space anything goes of course another proposal was um, to um, where we actually pr produced ringtones that could be downloaded from our website uh, and have your mobile phone with the typical Greglin or Rampoas sound. to get in touch with people whose parents or grandparents saw the work of Yannick Sinakis at the 1958 World Fairs in Brussels. Okay. So, apart from new subjects for ar the architectural press, um, trying to dig into a culture of seduction, a culture of experience, a culture of propaganda, a culture of new rhetoric. We also would like to try to reach out to people and to interact. Interact or die, one could say, these days. But of course there is a third pole. Defining space today is not a matter of physical space only anymore. It has also to do with mental space. And reaching out to people and trying to communicate with our readers is exactly about exploring the overlap between the mental space of our readers and the physical space, literally, about architecture that's covered in the, in, in the magazine, but also the magazine itself as a physical thing. But of course, a third category of space, which is network space. So we are now trying to develop a more um, ambitious strategy to um, discover opportunities in network space, uh, the internet. to show you our own site and a couple of examples how we try to do that on a pretty modest way in a pretty modest way so for instance we just had elections in Holland and as in many other countries these elections were very much about um, celebrities uh, small talk about uh, who is with whom, who is getting charge, who is will, who will be in charge when, and how, etc., etc. And we try to propose a couple of questions that are far beyond the average election debate. So you could go to the Arcus political opinion poll which was going along with a, an, a special issue on escapism in architecture. So you have, of course, uh, two kinds of escapism in architecture. You have the escapism of the rich, which might be seen as um, the, 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 the escape to the outback and building beautiful mansions far away from uh, dirty re reality. And you have also the escapism of the losers of this world, the refugees, locked up in the end in many asylum seekers all over the world. So we combine these two opposites into one 
visual discourse in the magazine. And if you would like to see it, I can show you after the lecture. But to explore this very notion of escapism, we presented this poll. So you could escape, but if you, if you, would, if you, were, if you are not a coward, you better vote, of course. So if you go to voting card number one, you can respond to all kinds of questions about uh, human gene manipulation, biometrics, and nanotechnology. And you can fill in a couple. I won't read them all right now, but let's say I do it this way, and then continue. And then you go to the next one, but you can, in, in, at the end, you can already see what kind of personality you are building up for yourself. So I don't want to carry a sensor about with me. I'm opposed to personal identification based on eye recognition. There must be a na no national data bank containing genetic material from every citizen, and so on and so on. So you go to another level, and you get questions about energy and environmental issues. Or you get questions about how to deal with the growing tension of an, of an aging baby boom. So by, so by proposing these kind of questions through the format of a poll, one might raise important questions beyond just uh, having a kind of one-dimensional, di one one unilateral discourse of one author. So finally, there was one voting card um, about ever-increasing mobility, digitization, the rise of digital networks, the advent of time-based multimedia applications in the built environment. They all undermine the significance of the material and physical environment as the touchstone of our existence. So in the end, we come back to architecture as we know it. But I give you another example of what we did in terms of um, creating discourse through the internet. So what we have here, go to, and sometimes it even changes reality. I'll give you an example. Where is it? So we presented an issue about Dublin. But not just Dublin as a city, but also Dublin, D-O-U-B-L-I-N as a mental concept. And it was based on the idea of James Joyce that you could write a novel based on the experience of one single walk through the city on one day, Bloomsday. So what we did is creating an animation and suggesting to make a Joycean walk through a city, not in physical space, but in cyberspace. Jumping from webcam to webcam image and going through this city, like you see here.
What we try to do is to present a map of Dublin as an example, how you could um, represent a city as a series of um, neighborhoods in which you could wander around virtually and creating your own Joycean experience. So what we have here is a map of Dublin and you click to one of these squares and you see here you see the web image you see the representation close up and you see the URL and if you for a for full year when you clicked on that URL you jump to that webcam so you really could walk through Dublin from webcam image to webcam image and update your walk every 10 seconds or so but something happened recently. The city of Dublin discovered this uh, Joycean strategy and decided to close it. So when you now click the URL, to all the URLs provided, you end up in a kind of uh, dead-end street of www.dublincity.ie. And you cannot, you cannot do anything with this anymore. So, apparently, with all the owners of websites, they chased them, tracked them down, and uh, forced them to uh, uh, have a kind of front page before the opening image of, their, of the previous uh, URL. And this is the, uh, the thing that they want to uh, represent Dublin with. A lovely walk in sunny Dublin a summer day. So apparently um, what we did is, was just a temporary thing after all but you see that it sometimes can induce um, actions from the authorities. version of that uh, a few minutes ago um, and it gave you the, the opportunity to reshuffle to reshape your own Holland but we also provided the website visitor with a um, complete overview of virtual Holland so what we have here is the complete web catalog of .nl sites and you can see you can wander around and you can find out how many initiatives institutions private people and the like are having their own website and make your Joycean walk not from webcam to webcam but from website to website I won't go into any of these because you never know where you end up. So, to round up this part, what is important is to think about architectural publishing in terms of uh, what we call uh, uh, the conceptual triangle between network space, physical space, and mental space and not just cover activities that are going on in these spaces but trying to explore the productive overlap between these three um, I think this, is, this strategy is um, bringing completely new territories to the field of architecture if you uh, go beyond production of physical spaces and think about 
creating events and creating situations and move these situations, establish social relations through and in this overlap and finding new interfaces for this overlap, there is a complete new field for architectural practice. And to show you that this can be more than just um, dreams, I'd like to show you a few projects in which we try to start a practice like that. for the silences every now and then but that's due to the multimedia program as a magazine we are making a magazine but as an idea we are working on this triangle. And as a practice, we try to start coalitions with... No, different architectural offices to work on actual practices. So this is a competition for the Berlin, Berlin Museum Island, uh, which required uh, an integrated communication concept to um, promote this site to the level of what they call the Louvre of Berlin. Trying to attract 10 million people per year. It's this area with uh, famous museums like uh, the Altus Museum and the Pergamon Museum. So we worked with uh, the office design under construction for this on this occasion to think about how with the, the idea of magazine making uh, um, as an underlayer, can we think of environments as being updatable and programmable? How can we think about uh, architectural sites and urban sites that might be fueled uh, on a on a, a regular basis by new meaning. And especially for this site, this is very important because um, it combines a, a very strong classical history and heritage that is uh, where, on which um, Europe is so fond, but also a strong Arabic, Arab uh, heritage. And it might be possible to use these two material uh, bodies of, of, of uh, knowledge and, her and heritage as a cornerstone for um, probing new relations between these two civilizations, which is badly needed today. So what we try to do is to uh, rethink this whole area in terms of uh, trajectories in which you could meet other people and uh, a kind of uh, animated functions on the site. I won't go into this too deeply, but the basic proposition we did was to use existing street signs and I iconic images on the spot as carriers for different programs. And um, providing the whole area with what we call the seventh museum. There are six existing physical museums on the spot and we tried to invent the seventh museum as the um, common denominator uh, providing the people with a kind of uh, experience that might uh, draw some lines between the other six by using light points this way to embed this system into the city, um, spreading out uh, 
to the other sides of uh, the Spray River. And there are many other aspects to Well, this is the iconic image again. But I won't go into that. i show you another uh, example. which is a project in the city of Rotterdam on the occasion of uh, cultural capital of Europe, Rotterdam 2001. It is a website, it starts with a website called tinytaboos.nl and you go there and you see, you can follow all kinds of discussions among locals from Rotterdam, young people mostly, um, anonymously expressing their taboos. So for instance, you go here, you can here start a new discussion on a new taboo. But you can also go to uh, other taboos in the category of uh, religion, for instance. So you see daily updated texts on the side of ongoing discussions and uh, you can um, jump in, dive in if you want uh, and also there are also larger issues like uh, uh, becoming, there is also kind of, uh, how do you say that, a kind of uh, hierarchy, you can, you can work on gaining a larger role in this uh, community by uh, becoming a hero and uh, here is uh, uh, in Dutch unfortunately an introduction to um, how to become a local hero there are already a few here um, but more importantly in terms of architecture practice what has been done in this project is to interface this website traffic onto the city. And then I need to go back to... Where is it? So now we are on the same interface again. And then I show you a couple of devices in which you might consider how to interface these discussions on the web in the city environment by using PDAs, for instance, by using street signs, road signs, public transport signs, facades, LED screens in the subway things like that. So these discussions are spatialized and interfaced in the city. And this provides you with a kind of early example how to uh, use web traffic as um, a constituent part of designing physical spaces.
And to make one more, a little bit more tr dramatic example, uh, to, 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 to bring forward one more dramatic example of how to um, merge virtual, mental and physical spaces, I'd like to show you two movies of projects we did with um, Gus Osterhuis, architect. It's a Transports Project 2001. And this is a project that has been produced uh, initially as being part of the Rotterdam 2001 program, it can be seen as, a, as an interface actually for many, many other uh, programs. Because this is uh, what I call reprogrammable and updatable architecture, since it can no longer be seen as providing you with a certain space for a certain function, but more with providing you with a certain broadcasting time as the essence of architecture. This is truly time-based architecture because you can um, use it in different modes. If you... This is the slumber mode. If this is a building, for instance, a, a visitor pavilion, um, and you don't want it to move, you switch off the button and you have the slumber mode. But if you want to use this building for different purposes, for instance, a studio or uh, a pavilion, uh, an exhibition pavilion, or a discotheque, or a conference hall, or whatever, you may uh, program that building for that specific amount of time according to your wishes. You can program the size of the volume, but you can also program the content of the building. It is about content production. In that way, it is close to magazine making. It needs content. It needs a definition of the parameter to define the volume and the size and the meaning of this building. And inside this is even more clear as an argument because it will be completely covered by uh, screens and you need, of course, more an operator than an architect in the old sense to, or maybe not an operator, a curator to define the program of this building. It's broadcasting its meaning. Apart from programming it, programming it uh, on a hard disk level, one might say, you can also think of programming this building um, as a network space. It is a physical space, but it can be seen as a network space if you define a right interface to a website that can be hosting this, that can host this building as its uh, own uh, offspring. Because that's the intention to create a web environment first and attach a building to it. So rather than what we are used to, websites attached to existing institutions and buildings that you can go to to find some information about these institutions, you can also think about buildings as an attachment to websites where web traffic is interfaced into the visual and corporeal effects of the building. So what we try to do is to propose a kind of study project which deals with the following. The question, namely, how to design an architecture that reflects the net society? Can we design an architecture that starts moving if you want it to do so? Can we design a building that adapts itself to different uses? Can we design environments that are linked to all kinds of remote environments? Can we conceive of an architecture that is possible 
that there's a possible modality of net activity? And the answer is simply yes. This is the prototype. Transport is a fully interactive visitor pavilion that can on several counts be termed moving. To begin with, the building will be constructed through a space frame of pneumatic structural components so that the volume of the building is fully manipulable. Secondly, the interior of transports is fully uh, dictated by display screens, as I said. Form and image are permanently in the process of being reprogrammed via input from people and physical circumstances on the spot as well as from remote sources, the distant online environments as, uh, as I described them, uh, the internet traffic to which the building is hooked up. This total intermixing of construction, form, image and use made possible by satisfactory broadband connection, current CPU technology and adequate interface design spawns a building that has completely shaken off its static character. Accordingly, the pavilion is able to assume various identities. Because structure, text and image are programmable, the interior can effortlessly adapt to intrinsically different uses. Another modality to show you. This is the GSM mode. What I mean with mod, mod, uh, different uses is the same as saying that it can assume certain modes. For instance, the slumber mode can be seen as the archaic mode. The building does not transmit, it is turned off. Or the performance mode. The show taking place inside the pavilion determines the form and the configuration and transmits this during the show. Or the TV mode. The space is used as a TV studio. Or a commercial mode. It's used as a 3D billboard. Or research mode. The space is used for research into human space relationships. And so on and so on. Let me finish this. If a building can be taken over spatially by multiple users on the basis of appointments, parameters, so too can its meaning. You know, architectural meaning, meaning is no longer etched in stone. The building has a continuous program, not on the walls, but including the walls. The material medium becomes the program and it reacts to use. And this use can therefore be multiple and as such alternate according to user and client. This is the new form of time sharing. As well as usable spaces, the building offers transmission time. And this leads to seven points for a new architecture. As a pilot project, it will be one, a step in fusing spatially and digitally disparate ranges of experience. Two, an attempt to reduce the redundant character of static architecture as a repetitive visual element in our existence in favor of a more flexible, informative response to the public. Three, it is a serious attempt to achieve a truly moving structure governed both by direct physical and remote digital input. This implies a new human space interface. Four, it is a contribution to the development of architecture as a filmic discipline through the progressive integration of the constructional with the visual aspect. Five, it is a prototype for adaptive architecture capable of dragging the discipline away from its eternal obeisance 
to peak usage, it will be possible to see what happens when the volume contracts in response to lower usage. As such, transports can be seen as an ecological project. However, these are all values that reside in architecture as we know it. Architecture as a physical discipline. But I was talking about architecture as a way of publishing. There are two more points in that respect to me. Transport is also a fully uploadable and updatable architecture. It puts architecture on air in the form of transmission time. This can be with content from art, commerce, public sphere, and so on. As a client, you don't, don't just rent space, you rent time. Secondly, in this respect to, with respect to publishing, this time in, is in terms of, uh, in, in time in terms of media can only be internet time. This is the first architecture that not only has a website attached to it, as I said, but it is itself an attachment to a website. You can go there, transports.com. The internet side of transports has architecture as its 3D interface. So, one might say, what we need is uh, to, to program such an architecture is uh, an, an strategy that is similar to what editors do or to what uh, stage designers do or to what um, choreographers do. They also have to think about the updatability and reprogrammability of their productions constantly. And that might be a mission for architecture as well. The result of this is the rise of a digital Gothic. It is no longer, as Le Corbusier said, architecture as the play of volumes under light, but it is light. It is a full-blown architecture of light. It is multiple architecture without a contingent form, territory, client, representation, space, or iconography. Such a building doesn't need a developer, not even a designer. Since this is all about staging the contemporary, it foremost needs a curator. And of course, such architecture needs a publisher. Thank you. Well, I would be happy to take some questions if you like. Is there any comment, remark, criticism? Hi. Of course, that all boils down to uh, the question of definition of architecture, of course. Uh, I believe that architecture as a, as, a, as, a, as a profession, but also as a, 
cultural medium and is specialized in dealing with space but also specialized in dealing with uh, the creations the creation of situations it is situational it is it is it was already about staging uh, about relating functions uh, although most of the time we believe that these functions should be adja uh, adjacent you know, the adjac adjacency imperative of architecture was always there and since we live through a network society we start to learn about non-adjacent environments uh, linked with each other through net connections um, and one can say that architecture as um, uh, a venerable old discipline has nothing to do with that because it's about making it's about the uh, it's about shelter and if you like to uh, that's about build, it's building and if you would like to uh, make this shelter beautiful or interesting or sublime or whatever then it's architecture but I, I believe that uh, uh, if this profession is ambitious and uh, hopeful about being part of that shift and this migration from the adjacency imperative to a non-adjacent uh, environmental environment making um, it has lots of uh, assets to uh, propose to this new economy of science and this is exactly not relying on the handicraft attitude but relying on this um, this tradition of staging situations so it's a, in a way a matter of mentality uh, in the end do you want that do you want to be part of that or do you like to uh, confine yourself to uh, providing people with shelter which is a completely acceptable position to take I, I have nothing against that but uh, uh, it's, it's a great would you like to be part of the of the other possibilities and other uh, opportunities architecture can take. question I make it visible for you for this occasion I've made it visible for you for this occasion you know it, 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 it's not essential the whole concept can be visualized and presented as a building which needs a site and needs a volume etc etc but you're right you can you can uh, if you think about modalities you uh, you can think of uh, animating existing environments so if architecture is, a, is an art of animating and, and, uh, environments, they can easily be, can easily be um, existing environments. This was a new one. This is an, the animation of a new environment because it's a new uh, shell and all kinds of things can happen in that shell. But at the same token, one could, one could use this space it has been done recently, I think. Uh, with, it, was a, it was a lecture by uh, Tom Main. He tried to animate this space, was, wasn't it? And, 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 and to reshape and re-experience this, this space by using projection technologies. So that's uh, using projection technologies and sensor technologies in existing spaces is creating new env 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 environmental experiences. So this is, this is a radical proposal uh, to make the argument most visible, but it's not, it's not essential for the argument. Yeah.
I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's the background. And my background and, and your background that, 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 uh, that uh, moves us to finding words in that direction. I can imagine that if I would be a filmmaker or a director, I could more or less talk into the same direction, creating a new mandate for my discipline. If I wasn't an architect, supposedly I was a director, I would like to find new mandates for my profession, I could easily go into the same direction, uh, trying to find work in creating environments uh, that might be animated through film, filmic techniques. But I think architecture is such a generous term, it has always been. Uh, it can incorporate and appropriate uh, so many uh, uh, practices as it has done in the past that I feel perfectly okay with it. I, I never felt anything of like, like it's too small of a term to describe these new practices. It, is, it has been enlarged so much already in the last uh, two and a half thousand years. I feel pretty comfortable with it. Saturation of yeah, of course. Uh, the, I started with the slumber mode. You remember? I, I, it's it's not just an example. It's a very important thing because um, you need you need the archaic mode because there is a kind of tolerance level in any human being uh, in accepting um, distraction or accepting uh, information. You know, you need redundancy. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very old informational theory. You need a certain degree of redundancy to accept new information. And if this, if, if this example of a moving, a moving volume with lots of moving images is, it would be a kind of a fatal condition, we are, uh, surely we are going beyond a certain tolerance level. That's why we need uh, uh, to think about scaling scaling it and maybe for an expo a world expo uh, we can uh, stand a higher uh, uh, degree of information than if it would be our own dwelling or our own uh, uh, workspace or something so it's definitely very important to, to, to scale it You mean contemporary politics, or glo global politics, yeah. or, or the politics of architecture? Yeah. Well, maybe it's it's good to to uh, uh, come back to that because I I not for no, not for nothing I started with that statement because um, what I tried to show you in the end also on the level of magazine making, but if it goes beyond that into designing spaces and uh, creating environments and uh, creating uh, social relations and creating uh, situations, movable situations as I, as I described. Um, it's, it easily um, falls back into that um, propaganda machine. You know, architecture is already very much a vehicle in the experience economy and very much assuming a new rhetoric of overwhelming you as, 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 a, as, a, as a client in the initial stage, but also as a public later. Uh, so it's heavily um, entangled in that new economy of science. 
And what I try to do is to um, preserve a certain critical discourse by writing, by showing new subjects for architecture, by uh, 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 trying to make awkward connections between uh, not very uh, uh, predictable subjects in, in the journalism I'm, I'm doing, but also in terms of uh, shifting situations from one to another and trying to get hold of uh, the programming capacity that most architects easily give away after uh, 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 delivering a volume like this, easily it is been it has been it is given to a client or to some users who are using this for a commercial uh, uh, project or something. So what I would like to to propose, and that's what we did in, in the Berlin project, but also in the transport project, is try to not just to deliver the space, but also be part as architects of the programming and reprogramming stages that comes after delivery. So that, that's, that's maybe the, the coming full circle with the political statement. That if, if we are moving from, um, from a culture of argument to a culture of propaganda, um, it's important to be in the middle of the, the process, the, the fabrication of meaning, and not just delivering a kind of uh, a carrier and that's it, and leave it to other uh, cultural engineers to use that carrier, that vehicle. That might respond to your first question, I, I, I hope. And if it comes to um, sustainability, well, of course, that's, that's a very important angle. And uh, uh, I said a few things about it terms of using these kind of reprogrammable, reprogrammable spaces um, and reshapable spaces in a, in a way um, as exploring an architecture which is not apt to peak usage. You know, we are used to architecture which has to, which has to address a peak usage at a certain moment of time. It can be logist, it can be infrastructure, it can be housing, it can be a uh, 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 utilitarian uh, building. Um, there is an existing level of, uh, um, it, it, it needs to uh, sustain a high level of use, if, I, if that's correct English. And um, if we really can explore an architecture which sh uh, can uh, be compressed and expanded according to different stages in time, and a, and a time-based architecture on an ecological basis, that might be helpful in rethinking the, 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 the way architecture deals with sustainability. But uh, I'm not sure whether this completely covers your issue, but uh, at least it's something. Any more questions? No? Oh, there. Peter Eisenman uh, was very lucky in finding Jacques Derrida uh, to, to write an article about why is the architecture of Peter Eisenman so good. So it's a philosopher, an outsider, who wrote an article about how good the architecture of Peter Eisenman was uh, I think 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, you, you were asking me to take a completely other position. You know, I, I present the work and now you would like to uh, you'd like me to take a, a kind of critical position towards towards the board and, and find out what to to, to, to reach a certain uh, judgment about um, the the quality of the Dutch production. I think um, again you shouldn't ask me. Maybe maybe during dinner.
Well, I can answer that in many ways, but um, one might say that uh, making a magazine this way is, uh, in terms of propaganda, it's using a magazine as uh, the provider of associations. So rather than being very discursive or critical in a traditional sense, like choosing a subject, um, arguing, arguing about it, rounded off, like a linear uh, discourse, what, what's essential to a culture of propaganda is that it is associative. It is full of associations. It's full of um, um, circumstantial evidence. I think that's, that's really a contemporary thing, that we are more and more accepting that issues are raised by using circumstantial and associative evidence rather than decisive and precise evidence. And if it comes to um, journalism, it's the same thing. And you can use these techniques by providing associations. So you have the magazine, it's, it's an integrated object in itself, and there are still articles by authors and still photo, photographs, delineated and uh, clear-cut. But on the other hand, you can work with this material and reshape it, and reshuffle, and find new configurations with the same material, which is a kind of associative process. In that sense, it, it is using the techniques of propaganda, or the culture of propaganda. And if you like, um, of course, if you use, this is also a flyer, you know, you can, you, can, you can use this as an invitation to an artist party. And even you can use it as a, as a, a response form or something, uh, if you would like to di react directly to, to, the, uh, to the publisher, you can use it for that as well. So in that case, I would be, uh, I would be glad to admit that it might be useful in that strict sense of propaganda as well. Was, there was one more. <laughs> one more there. you to decide. I, I cannot uh, look into your head and see what, what, where you are convinced by. Whether uh, this is associations or is, is it a pure argument? Tell us what happened. Thank you.